All right, welcome to the first lecture overview video of Introduction to Pharmacology and the Principles of Drug Action. I'm going to be your professor, Professor DePaolo. And uh, in this lecture, we're going to go over the very basics of different aspects of pharmacology, um, stemming from pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, major implicated pathways in pharmacology, and a lot of these major pathways that cause different cellular outcomes, which then lead to different physiological outcomes, such as hypertension. Um, we'll talk about adrenaline a little bit. We'll talk about um, other, uh, other uh, commonly known things. So first, uh, we're talking about uh, what is pharmacology? And, and anyway, what are we going to learn about? So we're talking about drugs. Now, drugs could either have a therapeutic outcome, which is a beta blocker for hypertension or an anti-cancer drug for cancer, uh, chemotherapy, things like that, preventative, like a vaccine, like we're seeing for COVID, or different diagnostic purposes, such as for, um, let's say, for your thyroid or for other organs, we like to radio li label different drugs that get processed in your body, and then we can see an image, and it can be used as an imaging diagnostic technique. Um, also, the physical chemical nature of drugs, there, we we'll learn all about their receptors and, um, and other concepts. So, the one of the main concepts of this lecture is the difference between pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. And of course, during the lecture, we'll go into this in a little more detail, but basically pharmacokinetics is what the body does to the drug. So we have a name for this, it's called ADME. So what happens when you enter, when a drug enters your body, whether it be through um, your orally, whether it be intravenous, um, inter-arterial, -art whether it be rectal or, or any or, or in, inhaling, when a drug enters your body, what happens to it? What happens to the drug, not your body? So how does the body deal with the drug? How is it absorbed? How is, how is it distributed throughout the tissues? How is it metabolized? Whether that drug compound can be broken down? What, how is it excreted? What is the half-life? How fast does this happen? These are all pharmacokinetic properties and are extremely important for categorizing drugs and um, just and for really any type of drug, we need to know these properties. Also, the pharmacodynamic properties is why are we even putting the drug in your body? We want to see what the drug does to your body. We want to see the physiological and biochemical outcomes. These are very important. So here is the the idea of what we're talking about. Pharmacokinetics is what the body does to the drug. So how fast is or how long? is the high effective concentration in the body of the drug. And then over time, you see the body excretes the drug. Pharmacodynamics is as you increase the concentration of drug, the effect is increased. So we wanna balance both of these things and we want, we may want a drug to have a longer effect for a longer period of time. We might want a drug to have a long, a great effect over a short period of time, such as, um, any kind of pain relief medication. We don't want those drugs to be covalently bound, which means they're irreversible because then it will block necessary receptors for other purposes. So then we talk about pharmacogenomics, which is uh, a really uh, new field that, that a me a medicine and, and personalized medicine uh, begins to, uh, begins to um, delve into, such as different uh, personalized genetic makeup so if a cancer patient gives a tissue sample and we can figure out which type, specific type of mutations are involved in that cancer, we can prescribe an inhibitor for those mutations. So here's an idea, of, here's a, an example of these personalized medicines. So you have, this is, this is a GI tract. Uh, well, this is, this is a cell. And this cell happens to be in the GI tract. And a lot of these, receptors and proteins that are in the GI tract cells are in every cell. But we have what's happening here is we have an, um, a different growth factors of binding to receptors, which are then increasing the rate of proliferation of the cells. That's in all what's happening here. And we have a ton of different drugs that are impacting every part of this pathway. And based on the mutations that are involved in a specific patient, we can target specific parts of this metabolic pathway. That's what drug discovery is aiming to do. All these drugs we learn about today or all, and throughout the entire course are going to be taking a signal transduction metabolic pathway and interfering with it, either activating it or inhibiting it in a way. That is in, generally what's that's in general what's happening. So what is a drug? 
So a drug must have, it's a molecule. It's either a large molecule or a small molecule. Now the size, 90% of drugs are small molecules that are less than 500 Daltons. We have large molecules, which are antibodies or different, what we call biologics. They can have an electric charge that can help them or hurt them, whether they um, go into their target. Um, their shape is specific to the receptor, the atomic composition, and its ability to be transported and, and its metabolism. So um, prodrugs, so prodrugs are a way that scientists we use to take advantage of the natural metabolism of the body. So during metabolism, certain drugs that enter your body get broken down and some of these structures become different. So um, a prodrug is a drug that when the original drug enters your body, it is then metabolized to be the active metabolite, so the active uh, pharmacophore. So it, for example, codeine, if codeine is it's methylmorphine, goes through demethylation or no, otherwise known as dealkylation. So you see the codeine on the bottom right that has this methyl group on this oxygen and it goes through dealkylation, it becomes morphine and it becomes active as a, as a uh, pain relief, as a, a very strong addictive pain relief substance. And codeine also has its, its different biological functions. But here's an example of a prodrug that when it becomes, um, goes through metabolism, it has its main function. So um, we'll learn a little bit more about that during the lecture. And drug size, we have Lipinski's rule of five, which is just five, or, or there, there's, there's only four postulates, but they call it five. Um, that governs, it's kind of a loose rule of, of small molecule drugs in terms of their size, in terms of their number of hydrogen bond donors and acceptors. Um, drug shape, we need um, chirality is important um, and, and it's seen in a lot of different drugs. And uh, we want the drugs to have the shape that is complementary to the binding site. So we want them to fit extremely um, tight. So we want high affinity drugs. So drug body interactions, right? So we we talked about this already. So the action of the drug on the body is the pharmacodynamics. The action of the body on the drug is the pharmacokinetics. So here's some more, just going in detail of those pharmacodynamic principles. You can pause this and take a look, but I've already covered this in this overview. Um, so receptor theory, we're gonna be learning a lot about different types of receptors. So receptors are the component of the cell that is, on, that is bridging the extracellular domains extra outside of the cell into the intracellular space to form or to perform a metabolic function. And it usually starts the interaction. It starts the metabolic function. So uh, we usually have different factors, whether they be hormones, growth factors, um, neurotransmitters that are binding to receptors and causing an intracellular response. We can have drugs bind to these receptors to stop the intracellular response or to uh, hyperactivate this intracellular response. Or we can have drugs that can cross the cell membrane and go into the cell to, um, to inhibit or activate certain members of this metabolic pathway. So there's a lot that can be done and it's, it's, a, it's a wide three-dimensional world. So here's an idea of transmembrane signaling. You have a drug, it binds to a receptor. Um, the receptor could be inside the cell or outside the cell, but let's say it's, out, let's say it's inside first for case one. And this is an example of a, like, let's say a steroid hormone. Hormone steroids can cross the cell membrane, bind to an intracellular receptor. That, that receptor itself or something that the receptor activates can then go into the nucleus to regulate gene expression. That's one example. Another example is you have a normal receptor that's membrane bound. A uh, ligand, extracellular ligand, whether it be a growth factor or a hormone, binds to the extracellular binding pocket, which then leads to a turnover of substrate A to B, causing a cellular response. Three, you have the same thing, but it leads to an adapter protein, which then can phosphorylate. And then you have a, a kinase cascade. So the word kinase is going to be thrown around a lot, which means to phosphorylate something. So kinases phosphorylate. And also the opposite of that, phosphatases dephosphorylate. So you have ion channels like in four, uh, where you have a ligand bind to the receptor and then it opens a channel for ions to be pushed through or different molecules. And then we have different, this is a example of a um, GPCR, which we're going to talk about, which is 
um, you have a extracellular ligand binds to the receptor, which then causes the, the recruitment of other proteins and enzymes, which then causes the turnover of one substrate to another. In this case, it would be GDP to GTP, or later on in the GPCR, we can be talking about um, uh, ATP to CAMP, which we'll talk about all of those. That's just an example. That's just the explanation of what I just said. Um, so we're going to be talking about different receptors. Um, um, to cross the cell membrane, you want to be lipid soluble, relatively lipid soluble, because the cell membrane is a phospholipid bilayer. So an example is a steroid hormone. These are lipid-like structures that are derivatives of cholesterol. And what they do is they traverse the cell membrane, bind to our cytoplasmic steroid receptor or, or, or hormone receptor, and then it bind, it goes into the nucleus, and it can directly be the transcription factor for um, an increase in whatever, an increase in, in gene expression. So um, there's other receptors too, of which we'll learn more about that during the lecture. Um, uh, receptor tyrosine kinases, we'll talk about those in detail. And also what we can look at is in the descriptions uh, of the slides, there's YouTube videos that go over the pathway mechanisms for each of these things, which we, we can look at some of these during class. So receptor tyrosine kinases, you, uh, to activate them, you have ligands and that causes a dimerization, autophosphorylation and so forth. So I know that there's a lot here, but we'll cover all, we'll kind of cover all of this in lecture. There is insulin. So what insulin is, insulin is a small molecule growth factor that binds to an insulin receptor, which is a receptor tyrosine kinase which then causes the upregulation of glucose intake into the cell. So that's why we, we say when we take insulin, we're increasing our, our, we're decreasing our blood glucose levels and we're increasing our cell glucose levels. So um, we're increasing the uptake of glucose and the processing of it. Uh, cytokine receptors. So cytokines are important for Im immune, the immune system and there is an important pathway called the JAK-STAT pathway that governs this. And here's a schematic of this. So the cytokine receptor, you have the cytokine, which is a immune factor, which can be an interleukin. Um, it can bind to the receptor and it then activates JAK proteins, which then bind to the receptor because they phosphorylate each other, which then in turn phosphorylates the receptor and then leads to the, the recruitment of the STAT which then STAT can form a homodimer. And then it itself is a transcription factor, which can lead to several gene expression results. And, and you can see a, a summary of those results here based on different interleukins and different types of receptors that are activated. So there is a lot of stuff. This is just a quick video going over what we're going to learn. So there's a lot. Um, ion channels, there are different ion channels that can be activated or inhibited, which can regulate the cell potential. Um, you see a lot of different movement with ion channels with nerves in the sodium potassium pump, and there's different drugs that can regulate this as well. And one molecule that is intrinsic to the body is acetylcholine, which causes the opening of the acetylcholine receptor uh, channel, and it allows sodium to flow in the concentration gradient. And here's an example of that. And so you have acetylcholine binds to this ion channel receptor, and then sodium is allowed into the cell. We'll, we'll learn more about that specifically. So I'll put a note here. I'll put um, ACH, where that's the short for acetylcholine pathway. We'll talk more. Well, I'll put a video of that in here. And then uh, a main part of the lecture is going to be GPCR. So GPCR is a huge family of receptors that are involved in a lot of different pathways. And basically what happens is you have this transmembrane receptor, which a extracellular ligand or an agonist binds to it, and then causes the transition from the already bound GDP guanine diphosphate to the guanine triphosphate, which activates the receptor. And it then leads to the, the, the uh, complex of G protein alpha, beta, gamma, and then once that is activated, here's a great schematic showing this. You have different um, G protein subunits, which upon activation activates adenyl cyclase, which then breaks down ATP to form cyclic AMP, which has a plethora of downstream cellular responses. 
And there's a lot, it really is a lot. So it could either be the contraction of smooth muscle, the uh, contraction of heart muscle, relaxation of heart muscle, depending on which type of GPCR is activated. There are GPCRs can also activate another pathway, which we call it the IP3 DAG pathway, which takes PIP2, PIP2, and then it breaks it down into the uh, phospholipase C, breaks down PIP2 into two products, IP3 and DAG, which then IP3 leads to the release of intracellular calcium from the, from the endoplasmic reticulum, and then DAG leads to the activation of the uh, protein kinase C. So we'll, go, we'll cover more about that in detail in class. We'll talk about pharmacodynamics more, um, agonists, so um, different types of drugs that can bind to receptors. So you have an agonist, which is something that hyperactivates and, or really causes the activation of the receptor. A competitive inhibitor binds to the same place that the agonist does, but it inhibits the activation leading to no activation. So the idea for a lot of drugs is we wanna make competitive inhibitors for already known natural agonists, which is extremely difficult because you're competing with 4 million or 4 billion years of evolution. We also have allosteric activators, which are easier to make. And I, my PhD thesis is one of, on one of these, but um, they're easier because you can target a different site that is not the very competitive active site and you can, you can change the, uh, the function. Same thing with an allosteric inhibitor. They also bind to different points. So we have full agonists, partial agonists, um, inverse agonists, um, which is basically does, it, it binds to the same place that the agonist does, but it has the opposite effect. And you can, so if you have an agonist, the receptor could be desensitized. Um, over the over the long course of this agonist being treat or this treatment of of the agonist, so um, that's another thing to keep in mind with drug resistance is that sometimes these receptors come down regulated when they're activated so much as a form of negative feedback. There's always feedback loops in the cell. Keep that in mind also. Um, beta arrestin is a is that process of the, the receptor degradation pathway where the receptors become internalized and then endocytosis happen, happens and then the receptor gets broken down and then um, there's no longer an effect of the agonist. So um, that's about it for this review video. I know there is a lot. I said a lot of different things. I kind of went brief through everything, but we're gonna cover it more in detail during the lecture and we'll have it more, um, more structured as well. So. Hopefully you just got a little sense of what's going on from this lecture because it's 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 very brief. And feel free to comment anything, any questions you have in the in the comments.